July thought all night, knowing that he had only to raise the pistol eased his mind a little. He had better go and find Elmira first. He wanted to explain to her that he had never meant to do whatever had caused her to run off. Once that was done, he could go off with the pistol and join his dead. The next morning he started walking, but he didn't feel the same. He felt like he no longer belonged to life. It would not have surprised him to see a cloud of buzzards circling over him. In spirit, he had gone to visit Roscoe. He finished his water that night, having walked all day through the brown wavy grass. He tried a long shot at a deer, but missed. The next morning he was awakened by the cawing of crows. He looked up to see several of them flapping overhead in the early grayness. He was tired from his long day's walk and didn't get up immediately. There was nothing to get up for but the bright sun and the shimmering plains. But he kept hearing the crows cawing and quarreling not far away. When he stood up, he saw a little grove of low trees not two hundred yards away. They weren't much, but they were trees, and the crows were resting in them. Among the trees he found a spring, just a trickle of a spring, but it had formed a shallow pool ten feet wide. A black snake was curled on a rock at the water's edge. It was probably what the crows were complaining about. July spent the day by the spring. He drank, bathed, and soaked his dirty clothes, spreading them out on the grass to dry. While he rested, a big badger walked up to the spring, and July shot him with his pistol. He had never eaten badger, but he ate this one and drank the spring water. Even better than food were the trees. Being in the shade again eased his spirit a little. He could look across the hot prairies for miles from the comfort of his shade. The sun couldn't parch him while he was under the trees. But he couldn't live forever on spring water and one badger. Besides, he had his chore to do. He waited until the cool of the evening and then set out again. The second day he crossed a wagon track coming from the south. It led him to a running creek, but he saw no wagon. The next day he saw a dust cloud, which turned out to be a small cow herd. The cowboys were mighty surprised to see a lone figure walking toward them from the west, and dumbfounded to learn that he was a sheriff from Arkansas. Did you come from California or where? the trail boss asked. He was an old white-mustached man named Johns, suspicious at first. Not many men came walking out of Texas. But July soon persuaded the old man to sell him a horse. It was the worst horse in the Remuda, but it was a horse. July gave forty dollars for it. The Johns outfit had no saddle to spare, but they did give him directions. They tried to get him to stay the night with them. They had been on the trail six weeks, and a stranger was a welcome novelty. But once he was mounted, July felt a sense of hurry seize him. He ate with them, thanked them again, and left under a rising moon. Four days later, sore from riding bareback on the little sharp-spined bay, he trotted into Dodge City. Chapter 66 Long before they struck the Republican River, Elmira had begun to wonder if any of it was worth it. For two weeks when they were on the open plain, it rained, hailed, lightning flashed. Everything she owned was wet, and she didn't like feeling like a muskrat, though it didn't bother Lucan's way. It was cold at night. She slept on wet blankets in the hard wagon and woke up feeling more tired than when she lay down. The plains turned soggy, and the wagon bogged time after time. The hides smelled, and the food was chancy. The wagon was rough, even when the going was good. She bounced around all day and felt sick to her stomach. If she lost the baby in such a place, she felt she would probably die. It occurred to her that she had taken a hard route just to escape July Johnson. Her own folly amused her. She had once thought of herself as smart, but look at where she was. If D. Boot could see her, he would laugh his head off. D. loved to laugh about the absurd things people did for bad reasons. The fact that she had done it because she wanted to see him would only amuse him more. D. would tell her she ought to have gone back to Dodge and asked one of the girls to get her work. 
Instead, she was driving a mule wagon across northern Kansas. They had been lucky and seen no Indians, but that could always change. Besides, it soon developed that Luke was going to be as much trouble as an Indian. It was something she knew that Zway hadn't noticed. Zway treated her kindly, insofar as he treated her at all. Now that he had got her to come on a trip, he seemed well content. She didn't have to do anything but be there. And he was surprised when she offered to cook, which she mainly did out of boredom, and because Zway and Luke were such dirty cooks, she was afraid she would get poisoned if she didn't take that chore into her own hands. Zway exhibited no lustful intentions at all. He seemed happy just to rest his eyes on her at the end of the day. Luke, on the other hand, was a feisty little rabbit who lost no time in making his wants known. In the early morning he would stand and relieve himself in plain sight of her, grinning and looking at her while he did it. Zway, who slept like a rock, never noticed this strange habit. Luke was not easy to discourage. Soon he took a new tack to persuade Zway that when they hunted, the two of them ought to hunt in separate directions. It was true that game was scarce, but that wasn't the reason Luke hunted by himself. All he was hunting was Elmira. As soon as he knew that Zway was two or three miles from the wagon, he circled back and pressed his suit. He was direct about it, too. He would tie his horse to the wagon and climb right in with her. He put his arm around her and made crude suggestions. No, Elmira said. I came with Zway. He told me I wouldn't be bothered. What bother? Luke asked. I'm going to have a baby, she said, hoping that would discourage him. Luke looked at her belly. Not for a while yet, he said. This ain't going to take no month. It probably won't take six minutes. I'll pay you. I won good money playing cards back at the fort. No, Elmira said. I'm afraid of Zway. She wasn't really, but it was a handy excuse. She was more afraid of Luke, who had mean eyes. There was something crazy in his looks. He also had a disgusting habit, which was that he liked to suck his own fingers. He would do it sitting by the fire at night, suck his fingers as if they were candy. Luke kept climbing up on the wagon and putting his hands on her, but Elmira kept saying no. She dreamed of D occasionally, but other than that she had no interest in men. She thought about telling Zway that Luke was bothering her, but Zway was not an easy man to talk to. Anyway, it might start a fight and Luke might win, in which case her goose would be cooked. Zway was strong, but slow, and Luke didn't look like a man who would fight fair. So when Luke snuck back and climbed onto the wagon seat, Elmira possumed. She couldn't stop his hands entirely, but she made herself into a tight little package and concentrated on driving the mules. When Luke saw he wasn't going to change her mind with talk or the offer of money, he tried threats. Twice he cuffed her, and once shoved her completely off the wagon seat. She fell hard and barely got out of way of the wagon wheel. Immediately she thought of the baby, but she didn't lose it. Luke cursed her and rode off as she climbed back up and drove the wagon. The next day he threatened to kill Zway if she didn't let him. Zway's dumb, he said. He ain't no smarter than a buffalo. I'll shoot him while he sleeps. I'll tell him that, Elmira said. Maybe he won't sleep. Maybe he'll kill you while you're at it. What have you got against me, Luke said. I mostly treat you nice. You knocked me off the wagon, she said. If that's nice treatment, I'll pass. I only want a little, Luke said. Only once. We're still a long ways from Nebraska. I can't go that long. The next day he caught her off guard and shoved her back in the wagon by the hides. He was on her like a terrier, but she kicked and scratched, and before he could do anything, the mules took fright and started to run away. Luke had to grab the reins with his pants half down, and when he did, Elmira grabbed Zway's extra rifle. When Luke got the mules stopped, he found a buffalo gun pointed at him. Luke smiled his mean smile. That gun would break your shoulder if you fired it, he said. Yes, and what would it do to you, she said. When I get you, you'll wish you'd give it to me, Luke said, flushing red with anger. He got on his horse and rode off. Zway came back well before sundown with a wild turkey he had managed to shoot, but Luke wasn't back. 
Elmira decided she might as well tell Zway she couldn't tolerate any more of Luke. Zway was mildly puzzled that Luke wasn't there. I chased him off with the gun, Elmira said. Zway looked surprised. His mouth opened, and the look spread up his big face. With the gun, he asked. Why? He tried to interfere with me, Elmira said. He tries it nearly every day once you go off. Zway pondered that information for a time. They had made a mess of cooking the turkey, but at least it was something to eat. Zway gnawed on a big drumstick while he pondered. Was it he tried to marry you? he asked. You can call it that if you like, she said. He tries to do me. I want him to let be. Zway said nothing more until he had finished his drumstick. He cracked the bone with his teeth, sucked at the marrow a minute, and then threw the bone into the darkness. I guess I'd better kill him if he's going to act that way, he said. You could take him with you when you hunt like you used to, she said. He couldn't pester me if he's with you. She had hardly spoken when a shot rang out. It passed between the two of them and hit the turkey, knocking it off its stick into the ashes. They both scrambled for the cover of the wagon and waited. An hour later they were still waiting. There were no more shots, and Luke didn't appear. I wonder why he shot the turkey, Zway said. It was done dead. He didn't shoot the turkey. He missed you, Elmira suggested. Well, it tore up the turkey, he said, when they came out of cover and picked up the cold bird. That night he slept under the wagon with a cocked pistol, but there was no attack. They ate cold turkey for breakfast. Two days later, Luke showed up, acting as if he'd never been away. Elmira was apprehensive, fearing a fight then and there, but Zway seemed to have forgotten the whole business. About the time Luke rode up, they spotted two or three buffalo and immediately rode off to shoot them, leaving Elmira to drive the wagon. They came back after dark with three fresh hides and seemed in good spirits. Luke scarcely looked at her. He and Zway sat up late cooking slices of buffalo liver. They were both as bloody as if they'd been skinned. Elmira hated the smell of blood and kept away from them as best she could. The next morning, before good light, she woke up gagging at the blood smell and looked up to see Luke sitting astraddle of her. He was rubbing his bloody hands over her bosom. Her stomach heaved from the smell. Luke was fumbling with her blanket, trying to get her uncovered. When he raised up to loosen his clothes, Elmira rolled on her stomach, thinking that might stop him. It did annoy him. He bent over her, and she felt his hot breath at her ear. You're no better than a bitch, dog. We'll have it that way, he said. She squeezed her legs together as tightly as she could. Luke pinched her, but she kept squeezing. Then he tried to wedge a knee between her legs, but he wasn't strong enough. The next thing she knew, Zway was dragging Luke over the side of the wagon. Zway was smiling as if he were playing with a child. He lifted Luke and began to smash his head into the wagon wheel. He did it two or three times, smashing Luke into the iron rim, and then he dropped him as if he were dead wood. Zway didn't really seem angry. He stood by the wagon, looking at Elmira. Luke had pulled her clothes half off. I wish he wouldn't act that way, Zway said. I won't have nobody to hunt with if I kill him. He looked down at Luke, who was still breathing, though his head and face were a pulp. He just keeps wanting to marry you, Zway said. Looks like he'd quit it. Luke did quit at that point. He lay in the wagon for four days, trying to get his breath through his broken nose. One of his ears had been nearly scraped off on the wheel. His lips were smashed and several of his teeth broken. His face swelled to such a point that they couldn't tell at first if his jaw was broken, but it turned out it wasn't. The first day he could barely mumble, but he did persuade Elmira to try and sew his ear back on. Zway was for cutting it off, since it just hung by a bit of skin but Elmira took pity on Luke and sewed on the ear. She made a bad job of it, mainly because Luke yelped and jerked every time she touched him with the needle. When she finished, the ear wasn't quite in its right place. It sat a little lower than the other, and she had pulled the threads a little too tight, 
so that it didn't have quite the right shape, but at least it was on his head. Zway laughed about the fight as if he and Luke had just been two boys playing, although Luke's nose was bent sideways. Then Luke developed a fever and got chills. He rolled around in the wagon, moaning and sweating. They had no medicine and could do nothing for him. He looked bad, his face swollen and black, it was strange, Elmira thought, that he would bring such punishment on himself just because he wanted to interfere with her. There was no more danger of that. When Luke's fever broke, he was so weak he could barely turn over. Zway went off and hunted, as he had been doing, and Elmira drove the wagon. Twice she got the wagon stuck in a creek and had to wait until Zway found her and pulled it out. He seemed as strong as either of the mules. They had not seen one soul since leaving the fort. Once she thought she saw an Indian watching her from a little ridge, but it turned out to be an antelope. It was two weeks before Luke could get out of the wagon. All that time Elmira brought him his food and coaxed him to eat it. All the passion seemed to have been beaten out of him. But he did say once, watching Zway, I'll kill him some day. You shouldn't have missed with that shot you had, Elmira said, thinking to tease him. What shot? he asked. She told him about the shot that hit the turkey, and Luke shook his head. I never shot no turkey, he said. I was thinking to ride off and leave you, but I changed my mind. Who shot it then? she asked. Luke had no answer. She reported this to Zway, but he had forgotten the incident. He wasn't very interested. After that, though, she grew afraid of the knights. Whoever had shot the turkey might still be out there. She huddled in the wagon, scared, and spent her days wishing they would come to Ogallala. Chapter 67 All through the territory, Newt kept expecting to see Indians. The prospect was all the cowboys talked about. Dish claimed there were all manner of Indians in the territory, and that some of them were far from whipped. The claim upset P.I., who liked to believe that his Indian fighting days were over. They ain't supposed to fight us no more, he said. Gus claims the government paid him to stop. Yes, but who ever heard of an Indian doing what he was supposed to do, Lippy said. Maybe some of them consider that they wasn't paid enough. What would you know, Jasper inquired. When did you ever see an Indian? I seen plenty, Lippy informed him. What do you think made this hole in my stomach? An Apache Indian made that hole. Apache, Dish said. Where did you find an Apache? West of Santa Fe, Lippy said. I traded in them parts, you know. That's where I learned to play the piano. I wouldn't be surprised if you forgot how before we come to a place that's got one, P.I. said. He found himself more and more depressed by the prospect of endless plains. Normally, in his traveling days, he had ridden through one kind of country for a while and then come to another kind of country. It had even been true on the trail drive. First there had been brush, then the limestone hills, then some different brush, and then the plains. But after that there had just been more and more plains and no end in sight that he could see. Once or twice he asked Dietz how soon they could expect to come to the end of them for Dietz was the acknowledged expert on distances, but this time Dietz had to admit he was stumped. He didn't know how long the planes went on. Over a thousand, I guess, he said. A thousand miles, P said. We'll all get old and grow beards before we get that far. Jasper pointed out to him that at an average of 15 miles a day, it would only take them about two months to get a thousand miles. Thinking of it in terms of months proved more comforting than thinking of it in terms of miles, so P. tried that for a while. When will it be a month up? he asked Poe Campo one night. Poe was another much relied on source of information. Don't worry about months, Poe Campo said. Months won't bother you. I'm more worried about it being dry. Lord, it ain't been dry yet, P. said. It rained plenty. I know, Poe said but we may come to a place where it will forget to rain. He had long since won the affection of Gus's pigs. The shoat followed him around everywhere. It had grown tall and skinny. It annoyed Augustus that the pigs had shown so little fidelity. 
When he came to camp and noticed the shoat sleeping right beside Pocampo's workplace, he was apt to make tart remarks. The fact that many of the men had come to regard Pocampo as an oracle also annoyed Augustus. Poe, you're too short to see far, but I hear you can tell fortunes, he said one morning when he had ridden over for breakfast. I can tell some fortunes, Poe allowed. I don't know if I can tell yours. I don't want nobody to tell mine, Jasper said. I might find out that I'm going to drown in the Republican River. I'd like to know mine, Augustus said. I've had mine told a few times by an old black woman in New Orleans, and they always say the same thing. Probably they tell you that you'll never be rich and you'll never be poor, Poe said, whipping at his scrambled eggs. That's right, Augustus said. It's a boring fortune. Besides, I can look in my pocket and tell that much myself. I ain't rich and I ain't poor exactly. What more would you like to know about your fortune, Pocampo inquired politely. How many more times I'm likely to marry, Augustus said. That's the only interesting question, ain't it? Which river I drown in don't matter to me. That's Jasper's interest. I'd just like to know my matrimonial prospects. Spit, Poe said. Spit in the wagon here. Augustus walked over to the wagon and spat on the boards. The day before, Pocampo had caught six prairie chicken hatchlings for some reason, and they were running around in the wagon bed, chirping. Poe came over and looked for a moment at Augustus's expectoration. No more wives for you, he said immediately, and turned back to his eggs. Well, that's disappointing, Augustus said. I've only had two wives so far, and neither of them lived long. I figured I was due one more. You don't really want another wife, Poe said. You are like me, a free man. The sky is your wife. Well, I've got a dry one then, Augustus said, looking up at the cloudless sky. The shoat stood on its hind legs and put its front hooves on the side of the wagon. It was trying to see the hatchlings. I'd have turned you into bacon long since if I'd known you were going to be so fickle, Augustus said. Can you tell stuff about a feller from looking at his spit? P.I. asked. He had heard of fortune tellers, but thought they usually did it with cards. Yes, Pocampo said, but he didn't explain. Just as they were about to cross into Kansas, some Indians showed up. There were only five of them, and they came so quietly that nobody noticed them at first. Newt was on the drags. When the dust let up for a moment, he looked over and saw the captain talking to a small group of riders. At first he supposed them to be cowboys from another herd. He didn't think about them being Indians until the captain came trotting over with them. Take him, the captain said, pointing to a steer with a split hoof who was hobbling along in the rear. By the time it registered that they were really Indians, they had already cut off the steer and were driving it away as the captain sat and watched. Newt was almost afraid to look at them, but when he did, he was surprised at how thin and poor they looked. The old man who was their leader was just skin and bones. He rode near enough for Newt to see that one of his eyes was milky white. The other Indians were young. Their ponies were as thin as they were. They had no saddles, just saddle blankets, and only one had a gun, an old carbine. The Indians boxed the steer out of the herd as skillfully as any cowboys, and soon had him headed across the empty plain. The old man raised his hand to the captain as they left, and the captain returned the gesture. That night there was much talk about the event. Why, they didn't look scary, Jimmy Rainey said. I reckon we could have whipped them easy enough. Pocampo chuckled. They weren't here to fight, he said. They're just hungry. When they're fighting, they look different. That's right, Lippy said. It don't take but a second for one to shoot a hole in your stomach. It happened to me. Call had formed the habit of riding over with Augustus every night as he took Lorena her supper. Augustus usually camped about a mile from the herd, so it gave them a few minutes to talk. Augustus had not seen the Indians, but he had heard about the gift of the beef. I guess you're getting mellow in your old age, he said. Now you're feeding Indians. They were just Wichita's, Call said, and they were hungry. That steer couldn't have kept up anyway. Besides, I knew the old man, he added. Remember old Bacon Rind? Or that's what we called him anyway. 
Yes, he was never a fighter, Augustus said. I'm surprised he's still alive. He fed us buffalo once, Call said. It was only fair he should have a beef. They were fifty yards from the tent, so Call drew rein. He couldn't see the girl, but he took care not to come too close. Augustus said she was spooked. Look how blue it is toward the sunset, Augustus said. I've heard about what they call the blue mounds. I guess those must be them. The prairie was rolling, and there were hump-like rises to the north as far as they could see. Though the sky was still bright yellow with afterglow, the mounds ahead did have a bluish electric look, almost as if blue lightning had condensed over their tops. In the dawn, the blue mounds shimmered to the north. Augustus usually came out of the tent early so he could see the sunrise. Lorena had stopped having so many nightmares, and she slept heavily, so heavily that it was hard to get her awake in the mornings. Augustus never rushed her. She had regained her appetite and put on flesh, and it seemed to him her sleeping late was healthy. The grass was wet with dew, so he sat on his saddle blanket watching Dish Boggett point the cattle into the blue distances. Dish always swung the point as close to the tent as he dared, hoping for a glimpse of Lorena, but it was a hope seldom rewarded. When Lorena awoke and came out of the tent, the herd was almost out of sight, though Lippy and the wagon were not far away. Pocampo and the two pigs were walking along, looking at things, a hundred yards ahead of the wagon. Augustus made room for Lorena on the blanket, and she sat down without a word, watching the strange little man walk along with the pigs. As the sun rose, the blueness to the north diminished, and it could be seen that the mounds were just low brown hills. It must be that wavy grass that gives it the blue look, or else it's the air, Augustus said. Lorena didn't say anything. She felt so sleepy that she could hardly sit up, and after a moment she leaned against Gus and shut her eyes. He put his arms around her. His arms were warm, and the sun on her face was warm. Sleep had pulled at her so much lately that it seemed she was never fully awake, but it didn't matter so long as Gus was there to talk to her and sleep close beside her. If he was there, she could let go and slide into sleep. He didn't mind. Often she would rest in his arms while he held forth, talking almost to himself, for she only half heard. Only when she thought of coming to a town did she feel worried. She stayed in her sleeps as long as she could, so as not to have to worry about the towns. Augustus stroked her hair as she lay against him. He was thinking how strange life was, that he and Lorena were sitting on a saddle blanket on the south edge of Kansas, watching Call's cattle herd disappear to the north. One little shot during a card game in Arkansas had started things happening, things he couldn't see the end of. The shot had ended up killing more than a dentist. Sean O'Brien, Bill Spettle, and the three people who were traveling with July Johnson had lost their lives so far, and Montana nowhere in sight. He ought to have taken his hanging, Augustus said out loud. Actually, Jake couldn't fairly be blamed for any of the deaths, though he could be blamed for Lorena's troubles, which were worth a hanging by Augustus's reckoning. Who ought? Lorena asked. Her eyes were open, but she still rested her head against Augustus's chest. Jake, he said. Look at all the bad that happened since he showed up. He wanted to take me to town, Lorena said. I wouldn't go. I didn't want no towns. I still don't want no towns, she said a little later, beginning to tremble at the thought of all the men that would be in them. Augustus held her close and didn't try to discuss it with her. Soon she stopped trembling. Two big hawks were skimming the surface of the prairie not far away. Look at them birds, Augustus said. I'd give a passel if I could fly like that. Lorena had an uneasy thought in her mind. Gus was holding her in his arms, as he had every day and night since he had rescued her. Yet he had not approached her, had never mentioned it. She understood it was kindness. He was letting her get well. She didn't want him to approach her, never would want any man to again. And yet it troubled her. She knew what men wanted with her. It wasn't just a bedfellow. If Gus had stopped wanting her, what did that mean? 
Would he take her to a town someday and say goodbye? My goodness, Laurie, you smell fresh as dew, he said, sniffing her hair. It's a miracle you can keep fresh out in these raw parts. One button had come off his shirt, and a few tufts of the white hair on his chest were sticking out. She wanted to say something, but she was afraid to. She tried to poke the little white chest hairs back under his shirt. Augustus laughed at the tidy way she did it. I know I'm a shameful sight, he said. It's all Carl's fault. He wouldn't let me bring my tailor on this trip. Lorena was silent, but fear was building up in her. Gus had become too important to her. It was disturbing to think that he might leave her some day. She wanted to make sure of him, but she didn't know how to do it. After all, he had already told her there was a woman in Ogallala. She began to tremble again from her sudden fear. What's the matter, he asked. Here it is, a beautiful morning, and you're sitting here shaken. She was afraid to speak, but began to cry. Laurie, we're an honest pair, he said. Why don't you tell me why you're so upset? He seemed so friendly that it eased her mind a little. You can have a poke, she said. If you want one, I wouldn't charge you. Augusta smiled. That's neighborly of you, he said. But why should a beauty like you drop her price? You ought to raise it, for you're getting more beautiful than ever. I ain't never seen nothing wrong with paying a toll to beauty. But you can have one if you want one, she said, trembling still. What if I want five or six, he asked, rubbing her neck with his warm hand. It relieved her. He was still the same. She could see it in his eyes. The truth is, you want to stay clear of such doings for a while, Augusta said. That's natural. You best take your time. It won't matter how much time, she said, and began to cry again. Gus held her. I'm glad we didn't break camp, he said. There's a rough cloud to the north. We'll be in for a drenching. I bet them cowboys is already floating. It suited her that it was going to rain and they would stay longer. She didn't like being too close to the cowboys. It was more restful just being with Gus. When he was there, it was easier not to think of the things that had happened. For some reason, Gus was still watching the cloud, which seemed to her no worse looking than many another cloud, but he was studying it intently. That's a darn funny cloud, he said. I don't care if it rains, Lorena said. We got the tent. The funny part is I can hear it, Augusta said. I never heard a cloud make a noise like that before. Lorena listened. It seemed she did hear something, but it was a long way off and faint. Maybe it's the wind getting up, she said. Augustus was listening. It don't sound like no wind I ever heard, he said, standing up. The horses were looking at the cloud, too. They were acting nervous. The sound the brown cloud made had become a little louder, but was still far away and indefinable. Suddenly, Augustus realized what it was. Good Lord, he said, it's grasshoppers, Lorry. I've heard they came in clouds out on the plains, and there's the proof. It's a cloud of grasshoppers. The horses were grazing on long leads. There were no trees to tie the ropes to, so he had loosened a heavy block of soil and put the lead ropes under it. Usually that was sufficient, for the horses weren't troublesome. But now they were rolling their eyes and jerking at the ropes. Augustus grabbed the ropes. He would have to hold them himself. Lorena watched the cloud, which came down on them faster than any rain cloud. She could plainly hear the hum of millions of insects. The cloud covered the plain in front of them from the ground far up in the air. It was blotting out the ground as if a cover were being pulled over it. Get in the tent, Augustus said. He was holding the terrified horses. Get in and pile whatever you can around the bottoms to keep them out. Lorena ran in and before Augustus could follow, grasshoppers covered the canvas every inch. Augustus had fifty on his hat, though he tried to knock them off outside the tent, and more on his clothes. He backed in, hanging to the lead ropes as the horses tried to break free. Pull the flaps, he said, and Lorena did. Soon there was just the hole the two ropes fed through. It was dim and dark in the tent, as more and more grasshoppers covered the canvas, insects on top of insects. 
The hum they made as they spread over the prairie grass was so loud, Lorena had to grit her teeth. As the tent got darker, she began to cry and shake. It was just more trouble and more fear, this life. It's all right, honey, it's just bugs, Augusta said. Hang on to me and we'll be fine. I don't think bugs will eat canvas when they've got all this grass. Lorena put her arms around him and shut her eyes. Augustus peeked out and saw that every inch of the lead ropes were covered with grasshoppers. Well, that old cook of calls that likes to fry bugs will be happy at least, he said. He can fry up a damn wagon full tonight. When the cloud of grasshoppers hit the Hat Creek outfit, they were on a totally open plain and could do nothing but watch it come in terror and astonishment. Lippy sat on the wagon seat, his mouth hanging open. Is them grasshoppers? he asked. Yes, but shut your mouth unless you want to choke on them, Pocampo said. He promptly crawled in the wagon and pulled his hat down and his serape close around him. The cowboys who saw the cloud while on horseback were mostly terrified. Dish Boggett came racing back to the captain, who sat with Dietz watching the cloud come. Captain, what'll we do? he asked. There's millions of them. What'll we do? Live through it, Call said. That's all we can do. It's the plague, Deet said. Ain't it in the Bible? Well, that was locusts, Call said. Deet looked in wonderment as the insects swirled toward them, a storm of bugs that filled the sky and covered the land. Though he was a little frightened, it was more the mystery of it that affected him. Where did they come from? Where would they go? The sunshine glinted strangely off the millions of insects. Maybe the Indians sent them, he said. More likely they ate the Indians, Call said. The Indians and everything else. Newt's first fear when the cloud hit was that he would suffocate. In a second, the grasshoppers covered every inch of his hands, his face, his clothes, his saddle. A hundred were stuck in Mouse's mane. Newt was afraid to draw breath for fear he'd suck them into his mouth and nose. The air was so dense with them that he couldn't see the cattle and could barely see the ground. At every step, Mouse crunched them underfoot. The whirring they made was so loud he felt he could have screamed and not been heard, although P.I. and Ben Rainey were both within yards. Newt ducked his head into the crook of his arm for protection. Mouse suddenly broke into a run, which meant the cattle were running, but Newt didn't look up. He feared to look, afraid the grasshoppers would scratch his eyes. As he and Mouse raced, he felt the insects beating against him. It was a relief to find he could breathe. Then Mouse began to buck and twist, trying to rid himself of some of the grasshoppers, and almost ridding himself of Newt in the process. Newt clung to the saddle horn, afraid that if he were thrown, the grasshoppers would smother him. From the way the ground shook, he knew the cattle were running. Mouse soon stopped bucking and ran, too. When Newt risked a glimpse, all he saw was millions of fluttering bugs. Even as he raced, they clung to his shirt. When he tried to change his reins from one hand to another, he closed his hand on several grasshoppers and almost dropped his rein. It would have been a comfort if he could have seen at least one cowboy, but he couldn't. In that regard, running through a bug cloud wasn't much different than running in rain. He was alone and miserable, not knowing what his fate might be. And as in the rainstorms, his misery increased to a pitch and then was gradually replaced by fatigue and resignation. The sky had turned to grasshoppers. It seemed that simple. The other day it had turned to hailstones. Now it was grasshoppers. All he could do was try and endure it. You couldn't shoot grasshoppers. Finally, the cattle slowed and mouse slowed and Newt just plodded along, occasionally wiping the grasshoppers off the front of his shirt when they got two or three layers deep. He had no idea how long a grasshopper storm might last. In this case, it lasted for hours. Newt mainly hoped it wouldn't go on all night. If he had to ride through grasshoppers all day and then all night, he felt he'd just give up. It was already fairly dark from the cloud they made, though it was only midday. Finally, like all other storms, the grasshopper storm did end. The air cleared. There were still thousands of grasshoppers fluttering around in it. 
but thousands were better than millions. The ground was still covered with them, and Mouse still mashed them when he walked. But at least Newt could see a little distance, though what he saw wasn't very cheering. He was totally alone with fifty or sixty cattle. He had no idea where the main herd might be, or where anything might be. Dozens of grasshoppers still clung to his shirt and to Mouse's mane, and he could hear them stirring in the grass, eating what little of it was left. Most of it had been chewed off to the roots. He gave Mouse his head, hoping he would have some notion of where the wagon might be, but Mouse seemed as lost as he was. The cattle were walking listlessly, worn out from their run. A few of them tried to stop and graze, but there was nothing left to graze on except grasshoppers. There was a rise a mile or two to the north, and Newt rode over to it. To his vast relief, he saw several riders coming, and waved his hat to make sure they saw him. The hoppers had nibbled on his clothes, and he felt lucky not to be naked. He went back to get the cattle, and when he glanced again at the boys, they looked funny. They didn't have hats. A second later, he realized why. They were Indians, all of them. Newt felt so scared, he went weak. He hated life on the plains. One minute it was pretty, then a cloud of grasshoppers came, and now Indians. The worst of it was that he was alone. It was always happening, and he felt convinced it was Mouse's fault. Somehow he could never stay with the rest of the boys when there was a run. He had to wander off by himself. This time the results were serious, for the five Indians were only fifty yards away. He felt he ought to pull his gun, but he knew he couldn't shoot well enough to kill five of them. Anyhow, the captain hadn't shot when the old chief with the milky eye had asked for a beef. Maybe they were friendly. Indeed, that proved the case, although they were rather smelly and a little too familiar to suit Newt. They smelled like the lard Bolivar had used on his hair. They crowded right around him, several of them talking to him in words he couldn't understand. All of them were armed with old rifles. The rifles looked in bad repair, but they would have sufficed to kill him if that had been what the Indians wanted to do. Newt was sure they would want the cattle, for they were as skinny as the first bunch of Indians. He began to try and work out in his mind how many he could let them have without risking dishonor. If they wanted them all, of course, he would just have to fight and be killed, for he could never face the captain if he had been responsible for the loss of fifty head. But if they could be bought off with two or three, that was different. Sure enough, a little short Indian began to point at the cattle. He jabbered a lot, and Newt assumed he was saying he wanted them all. No sabe, he said, thinking maybe some of the Indians knew Mexican. But the little short Indian just kept jabbering and pointing west. Newt didn't know what to make of that. Meanwhile, the others crowded around, not being mean exactly, but being familiar, fingering his hat and his rope and his quirt, and generally making it difficult for him to think clearly. One even lifted his pistol out of its holster, and Newt's heart nearly stopped. He expected to be shot with his own gun, and felt foolish for allowing it to be taken so easily. But the Indians merely passed it around for comment, and then stuck it back in the holster. Newt smiled at them, relieved. If they would give him his gun back, they couldn't mean to harm him. But he shook his head when they pointed at the cattle. He thought they wanted to take the cattle and go west. When he shook his head, it caused a big laugh. The Indians seemed to think everything he did was pretty comical. They jabbered and pointed to the west, laughing, and then to his dismay, three of them began to whoop at the cattle and got them started west. It seemed they were just going to take them. Newt felt sick with confusion. He knew the point had been reached when he ought to draw his pistol and try to stop it, but he couldn't seem to do it. The fact that the Indians were laughing and seemed friendly made it difficult. How shoot people who were laughing? Maybe the captain could have, but the captain wasn't there. The Indians motioned for him to come with them, and very reluctantly Newt went. He felt he ought to make a break for it, go find the cowboys and get them to help him reclaim the sixty head. 
Of course, the Indians might shoot him if he ran, but what really stopped him was the fact that he had no idea where the rest of the boys were. He might just charge off and be lost for good. So, with a sinking heart, he slowly followed the five Indians and the cattle. At least he wasn't deserting by doing that. He was still with the cattle, for what it was worth. Before he had gone a mile or two, he wished he had thought of another alternative. The plains had always seemed empty, and somehow, with the grass chewed off and him captured by Indians, they seemed even more empty. He began to remember all the stories he had heard about how tricky Indians were, and decided these were just laughing to trick him. Probably they had a camp nearby, and when they got there they might stop laughing and butcher him and the cattle both. The surprising thing was how young they were. None of them looked any older than Ben Rainey. Then they rode over a ridge so low it hardly seemed like a ridge, and there was the herd and the cowboys too. They were two or three miles away, but it was them. He could even see the wagon. Instead of stealing him, the Indians had just been keeping him from getting lost, for he had been angling off in the wrong direction. He realized then that the young Indians were laughing because he was so dumb he didn't even know which way his own cattle were. He didn't blame them. Now that he was safe, he felt like laughing, too. He wanted to thank the Indians, but he didn't know their words. All he could do was smile at them. Then Dish Boggett and Soupy Jones rode over to help him hurry the cattle along. Their clothes had little holes in them where the grasshoppers had nibbled through. It's a good thing they found you. We ain't had time to look, Soupy said. If we'd gone on north, it would be 60 miles to water, the Indians say. Most of these cattle wouldn't make no 60 miles. Nor most of these men either, Dish said. Did the grasshoppers hurt anybody? Newt asked, still amazed that such a thing could happen. No, but they ruined my Sunday shirt, Soupy said. Jasper's horse spooked, and he got thrown, and claims his collarbone might be broken. But Dietz and Poe don't think so. I hope Lori didn't suffer, Dish said. Their horses could have spooked. They might be a foot and a long way from grub. I suppose you'd like to go check on their safety, Soupy said. Somebody ought, Dish said. Ask the captain, Soupy said. I expect he'll want to assign you the chore. Dish thought otherwise. Already the captain was looking at him as if he expected him to rush back to the point, although the cattle were moving along fine. You ask him, Newt, Dish said. Newt, Soupy said. Why, Newt was just lost himself. If he went looking for Gus, he'd just be lost again. Ask him, Newt, Dish said again, with such intensity that Newt knew he had to do it. He knew it meant Dish trusted him a lot to ask such a thing of him. The captain was talking in sign to ten or twelve young Indians. Then the Indians went over to the herd and cut out three beeves. Newt rode over, feeling foolish. He didn't want to ask the captain, but on the other hand, he couldn't ignore Dish's request. Do you think I ought to go check on Mr. Gus? Newt asked. The boys think they might be in trouble. Call noticed how nervous the boy seemed and sensed that somebody had put him up to asking the question. No, we better all drive, he said. Gus had a tent. I imagine he's happy as a badger. They're probably just sitting there playing cards. It was what he had expected, but Newt still felt chastened as he turned back to the drags. He felt he would never learn to say the right thing to the captain. Chapter 68 Almost at once, before the group even got out of Texas, Jake had cause to regret that he had ever agreed to ride with the Suggs brothers. The first night he camped with them, not thirty miles north of Dallas, he heard talk that frightened him. The boys were discussing two outlaws who were in jail in Fort Worth, waiting to hang, and Dan Suggs claimed it was July Johnson who had brought them in. The robbers had put out the story that July was traveling with a young girl who could throw rocks better than most men could shoot. I'd like to see her throw rocks better than Frog can shoot, Roy Sugg said. I bet Frog could cool her off. Frog Lip didn't say much. He was a black man, but Jake didn't notice anyone giving him many orders. Little Eddie Suggs cooked the supper, such as it was, while Frog Lip sat idle, not even chopping wood for the fire. The horse he rode was the best in the group, a white gelding. 
It was unusual to see a bandit who used a white horse, for it made him stand out in a group. Froglip evidently didn't care. We ought to go get them boys out of jail, Roy Suggs said. They might make good regulators. If a girl and one sheriff can take them, I wouldn't want them, Dan Suggs said. Besides, I had some trouble with Jim once myself. I'd go watch him hang if I had time, damn him. Their talk, it seemed, was mostly of killing. Even little Eddie, the youngest, claimed to have killed three men, two nesters and a Mexican. The rest of the outfit didn't mention numbers, but Jake had no doubt that he was riding with accomplished killers. Dan Suggs seemed to hate everybody he knew. He spoke in the vilest language of everyone, but his particular hatred was cowboys. He had trailed a herd once and had not done well with it, and it had left him resentful of those with better luck. I'd like to steal a whole goddamn herd and sell it, Dan said. There ain't but five of us, Eddie pointed out. It takes more than five to drive cattle. Dan Suggs had a mean glint in his eye. He had made the remark idly, but once he thought about it, it seemed to make a great deal of sense. We could hire a little more help, he said. I remember that time we tried to drive cattle, Roy said. The Indians run off half of them, and we all nearly drowned in them rivers. Why try it again? You ain't heard the plan, so shut up, Dan said with a touch of anger. What we done wrong the first time was doing it honest. I'm through with honest. It's every man for himself in this country, and that's the way I like it. There ain't much law, and mostly it can be outrun. Whose herd would you steal? Jake asked. Oh, the closest one to dodge, Dan said. Find some herd that's just about there and steal it. Maybe a day or two shy of the towns. Then we could just drive it in and sell it and be gone. We'd get all the money and none of the work. What about the boys who drove it all that way, Jake asked. They might not want to give up their profits that easy. We'll plant them, Dan said. Shoot them and sell their cattle and be long gone before anyone ever missed them. What if one run off and didn't get planted, Roy said. It don't take but one to tell the story, and then we'd have a posse to fight. Frog's got a fast horse, Dan said. He could run down any man who escaped. I'd rather rob banks myself, little Eddie said. Then you got the money right in your hands. You don't have to sell no cows. Why, you're lazy, Ed, Dan said, looking at his brother as if he were mad enough to shoot him. In fact, the Suggs brothers seemed to live on the edge of fratricidal warfare. What do you boys know of this blue duck? Jake asked, mainly to change the subject. We know to let him be, Dan said. Frog don't care for him. Why not? Stole my horse, Froglip said. He didn't elaborate. They were passing a whiskey bottle around, and he took his turn as if he were a white man. Whiskey had no effect on any of them except little Eddie, who turned red-eyed and wobbly after five or six turns. Jake drank liberally, for he felt uncomfortable. He had not meant to slip into such rough company and was worried, for now that he had slipped in, he could see that it wasn't going to be any too easy to slip back out. After all, he had heard them discuss killing a whole crew of cowboys, calculating the killings as casually as they might pick ticks off a dog. He had been in much questionable company in his life, but the Suggs brothers weren't questionable. They were just hard. Moreover, the silent black man, Frog, had a very fast horse. Escaping them would need some care. He knew they didn't trust him. Their eyes were cold when they looked his way. He resolved to be very careful and make no move that might antagonize them until the situation was in his favor which it wouldn't be until they got into the Kansas towns. With a crowd around, he might slip away. Besides that, killing could always work two ways. Gus was fond of saying that even the meanest bad man could always run into someone meaner and quicker. Dan Suggs could easily meet a violent end, in which case the others might not care who stayed or went. The next day they rode on to Doan's store on the banks of the Red River and stopped to buy whiskey and consider their route. A trail herd was crossing the river a mile or more to the west. There's one we could steal right there, little Eddie said. That one's barely in the territory, Dan said. We'd have to follow it for a month, and I ain't in the mood. 
I say we head for Arkansas first, Roy said. We could rob a bank or two. Jake was not listening to the palaver very closely. A party of nesters, four wagons of them, had stopped at the store buying supplies. They were farmers, and they had left Missouri and were planning to try out Texas. Most of the menfolk were inside the store buying supplies, though some were repairing wagon wheels or shoeing horses. Most of the womenfolk were starved-looking creatures in bonnets, but one of them was neither starved nor in a bonnet. She was a girl of about seventeen with long black hair. She sat on the seat of one of the wagons, barefoot, waiting for her folks to finish shopping. To Jake she looks like a beauty. It occurred to him that beauties were his real calling, if he had one. And he wondered what could have possessed him to start out with a rough bunch like the Suggses, when there were beauties right there in Texas that he hadn't even met, including the one on the wagon seat. He watched her for a while, and since her folks hadn't reappeared, decided he might just stroll over and have a word with her. Already he felt a yearning for woman's talk, and he had only been gone from Dallas a little more than a day. He had been lounging in the shade of the store, but he stood up and carefully dusted his pants. "'Are you fixin' to go to church, or what?' Dan Suggs asked. "'No, but I fancy a word or two with that black-haired gal sitting there on the wagon,' Jake said. "'I've never talked to a woman from Missouri. I figure I might like it.' "'Why wouldn't they talk like any other gals?' Roy wondered." I heard you was a ladies' man, Dan said, as if it were a condemnation of some sort. You met me in a whorehouse, why would you doubt it, Jake said, tired of the little man's biting tone. If I like that gal, maybe I'll elope with her, he said, just to remind everyone that he was still his own man. The closer he got to the girl, the better he liked her looks. She had fine features, and her thin, worn-out dress concealed a swelling young bosom. She realized Jake was coming her way, which agitated her a little. She looked off, pretending not to notice him. At close range, she looked younger, perhaps only fifteen or sixteen. Probably she had scarcely even had bows, or if she had, they would only have been farm boys with no knowledge of the world. She had a curling upper lip which she liked. It indicated that she had some spirit. If she had been a whore, he would have contracted with her for a week, just on the strength of that lip and the curve of her bosom. But she was just a barefoot girl sitting on a wagon with dust on her bare feet. "'Hello, miss,' he said when he walked up. "'Going far?' The young girl met his eye, though he could see that she was agitated that he had spoken to her. "'My name's Jake Spoon,' he said. "'What's yours?' "'Lou,' she said, not much more than whispering the information." He did like the way her upper lip curved, and was about to say more, but before he could get the words out, something slammed him in the back, and his face was in the dirt. He hit the ground so hard he busted his lip. He rolled over, wondering if somehow one of the mules had got in a kick. It wouldn't have been the first time he was surprised by a mule, but when he looked up and blinked the dust out of his eyes, he saw an angry old man with a long sandy beard standing over him gripping a ten-gauge shotgun. It was the shotgun that had knocked him down. The old fool had whacked him across the shoulder blades with it. The man must have been standing behind the wagon. Jake's head was ringing, and he couldn't see good, though he could tell the old man was gripping the shotgun like a club. He wasn't planning to shoot. Jake got to his knees and waited until he caught his wind. You get, the old man said. Don't be talking to my wife. Jake looked up in surprise. He had assumed the old man must be her father. Though certainly a brusque greeting, it was not much more than he would have expected from a father. Fathers had always been touchy when he attempted to talk to their daughters, but the girl on the wagon seat was already a wife. He looked at her again, surprised that such a fresh pullet would be married to a man who looked to be in his seventies at least. The girl just sat there, pretty as ever, watching the scene without expression. That Jake had deigned to look at her again infuriated the farmer more, and he drew back the shotgun to deliver another blow. "'Hold on, mister,' Jake said. One lick he might let pass, but not two. 
Besides, the 10-gauge was a heavy gun, and used as a club, it could break a shoulder or do worse. When Jake spoke, the old man hesitated a second. He even glanced at the girl on the wagon seat. But at the sight of her, he drew back his lips in a snarl and raised the shotgun again. Before he could strike the second blow, Jake shot him. It surprised him as much as it did the nester, for he was not aware of having pulled his gun. The bullet caught the nester in the breast and knocked him back against the wagon. He dropped the shotgun, and as he was sliding to the ground, Jake shot again, the second shot as much a surprise to him as the first. It was as if his arm and his gun were acting on their own, but the second shot also hit the old nester in the breast. He slid to the ground and rolled partly under the wagon on top of his own shotgun. He never needed to hit me, Jake said to the girl. He expected her to scream, but she didn't. The shooting seemed not to have registered with her yet. Jake glanced at the nester and saw that he was stone dead, a big blood stain on his gray work shirt. A line of blood ran down the stock of the shotgun he lay across. Then nesters began to boil out of Doan's store. It seemed there were twenty or thirty of them. Jake felt discouraged by the sight, for it reminded him of how people had boiled out of the saloons in Fort Smith when they discovered Benny Johnson lying dead in the mud. Now another man was lying dead, and it was just as much an accident. If the old nester had just announced himself politely as the girl's husband, Jake would have tipped his hat and walked off. But the old man had whacked him and offered to do it again. He had only shot to protect himself. This time he was up against twenty or thirty nesters. They were grouped in front of the store as if puzzled by the situation. Jake put his gun back in its holster and looked at the girl once more. Tell him I had to do it, he said. That old man might have cracked my skull with that gun. Then he turned and walked back toward the Suggs brothers. He looked back once at the girl, and she smiled at him, a smile that was to puzzle him whenever he thought about it. She had not even got down from the wagon to see if her husband was dead, yet she gave him that smile though by that time the nesters were all around the wagon. The Suggs boys were already mounted. Little Eddie handed Jake his rein. I guess that's the end of that romance, Dan Suggs said. Darn, I just asked her name, Jake said. I never knowed she was married. The nesters were all grouped around the body. The girl still sat on the wagon seat. Let's cross the river, Dan Suggs said. It's that or hire you a lawyer, and I say, why waste the money? That store don't sell lawyers anyway, Roy Suggs remarked. Jake mounted, but he was reluctant to leave. It occurred to him that if he went back to the nesters, he might bluff his way out of it. After all, it had been self-defense. Even dirt farmers from Missouri could understand that. The nesters were looking their way, but none of them were offering to fight. If he turned and rode into the territory, he would be carrying two killings against his name. In neither case had he meant to kill, or even known the man he killed. It was just more bad luck. Noticing a pretty girl on a wagon seat was where it started in this case. But the law wouldn't look at it like that, of course. If he rode across the river with a hard bunch like the Suggses, he would be an outlaw, whereas if he stayed... The nesters might try to hang him, or at least try to jail him in Fort Worth or Dallas. If that happened, he'd soon be on trial for one accident or another. It was a poor set of choices, it seemed to him. But when the Suggs brothers rode off, he followed, and in fifteen minutes was across the Red River. Once he looked back and could still see the wagons grouped around the little store, he remembered the girl's last smile yet he had killed a man before he had even seen her smile. The nesters made no pursuit. Them punkin' rollers, Dan Suggs said contemptuously, if they was to follow, we'd send them out in a hurry. Jake fell into a gloom. It seemed he could do nothing right. He hardly asked for more in life than a clean saloon to gamble in and a pretty whore to sleep with, that and a little whiskey to drink. He had no desire to be shooting people, even during his years in the Rangers, he seldom actually drew aim at anyone, although he cheerfully threw off shots in the direction of the enemy. 
He certainly didn't consider himself a killer. In battle, Call and Gus were capable of killing ten to his one. And yet now, Call and Gus were respectable cattlemen, looked up to everywhere they went, and he was riding with a gang of hardened outlaws who didn't care who they killed. Somehow he had slipped out of the respectable life. He had never been a churchgoer, but until recently he had had no reason to fear the law. The Suggs brothers kept plenty of whiskey on hand, and Jake began to avail himself of it. He stayed half drunk most of the time as they rode north. Even though he had killed a man in plain sight of them, the Suggses didn't treat him with any new respect. Of course, they didn't offer one another much respect either. Dan and Roy both poured scorn on little Eddie if he slipped up in his chores or made a remark they disagreed with. The only man of the company who escaped their scorn was Froglip. They seldom spoke to him, and he seldom spoke. But everyone knew he was there. They rode through the territory without incident, frequently seeing cattle herds on the move, but always swinging around them. Dan Suggs had an old pair of spyglasses he had brought back from the war, and once in a while he would stand up in his stirrups and look one of the cattle outfits over, to see if they contained enemies of his, or any cowboys he recognized. Jake watched the herds, too, for he still had hope of escaping from the situation he was in. Rude as Call and Gus had treated him, they were still his compañeros. If he spotted the Hat Creek outfit, he had it in mind to sneak off and rejoin them. Even though he had made another mistake, the boys wouldn't know about it, and the news might never reach Montana, he would even cowboy if he had to. It beat taking his chances with the Suggses. He was careful not to give his feelings away, though. He never inquired after the herds, and if the subject of Call and McRae came up, he made it plain that he harbored a grudge against them and would not be sorry to see them come to grief. When they got into Kansas, they began to see the occasional settler, sod house nesters mostly. Jake hardly thought any of them could have enough money to be worth the trouble of robbing, but the younger Suggs brothers were all for trying them. I thought we was going to regulate the settlers, Roy said one night. What are we waiting for? A nester that's got something besides a milk cow and a pile of buffalo chips, Dan Suggs said. I'm looking for a rich one. If one was rich, he wouldn't be living in a hole dug out of a hill up here in Kansas, Jake said. I slept in one of those soddies once. So much dirt leaked out of the roof during the night that I woke up darn near buried. That don't mean some of them couldn't have some gold, little Eddie said. I'd like to practice regulating a little so I'd have the hang of it when we do strike the rich ones. All we aim to let you do is watch anyway, Dan said. It don't take no practice to watch. I've shot a nester, little Eddie reminded him. Shot two. If they don't pay up, I might make it three. The object is to scare them out of their money, not shoot them, Dan said. You shoot too many, and pretty soon you've got the law after you. We want to get rich, not get hung. He's too young to know what he's talking about, Roy said. Well, I won't shoot them then. I'll just scare them, little Eddie said. No, that's Frog Lips' job, scaring them pumpkin eaters, Dan said. He'll scare them a sight worse than you will. The next day, Froglip got his chance. They saw a man plowing beside a team of big horses. A woman and a small boy were carrying buffalo chips in a wheelbarrow and piling them beside a low sod house that was dug into a slope. Two milk cows grazed nearby. He can afford them big horses, Roy pointed out. Maybe he's got money. Dan had been about to ride past, and Jake hoped he would. He still hoped they'd hit Dodge before the Suggs boys did any regulating. He might get free of them in Dodge. Two accidents wouldn't necessarily brand him for life, but if he traveled much farther with a gun outfit like the Suggses, he couldn't expect a peaceful old age, or any old age, probably. But Dan decided on a whim to go rob the farmer if he had anything worth being robbed of. They usually hide their money in the chimney, he said. Either that or they bury it in the orchard, though I don't see no orchard. Froglip kept an extra pistol in his saddlebags, 
As they approached the farmer, he got it out and stuck it in his belt. The farmer was plowing a shallow furrow through the tough prairie grass. Seeing the rider's approach, he stopped. He was a middle-aged man with a curly black beard, thoroughly sweated from his work. His wife and son watched the Suggses approach. Their wheelbarrow was nearly full of buffalo chips. Well, I guess you can expect a fine crop along about July, if the damn Texas cattle don't come along and eat it all up, Dan said. The man nodded in a friendly way, as if he agreed with the sentiment. We're here to see you reap what you sow, Dan went on. It'll cost you forty dollars gold, but we'll deal with the herds when they show up, and your crops won't be disturbed. No speaking English, the man said, still smiling and nodding in a friendly way. Oh, hell, a damn German, Dan said. I figured this was a waste of time. Round up the woman and the sprout frog. Maybe this old Dutchman married an American gal. Froglip loped over and drove the woman and the boy near the farmer. He rode so close to them that if they had fallen, his horse would have stepped on them. He had taken the pistol out of his belt, but he didn't need it. The woman and the boy were terrified, and the farmer too. He put his arms around his wife and child, and they all stood there crying. Look at them blubber, little Eddie said. I never seen such cowards. Will you shut your damn mouth, Dan said. Why wouldn't they be scared? I would be in their place. But I'd like to get the woman hushed crying long enough to see if she can talk English. The woman either couldn't or wouldn't. She didn't utter a word in any language. She was tall and skinny, and she just stood there by her husband crying. It was plain all three of them expected to be killed. Dan repeated his request for money, and only the boy looked as if he understood it. He stopped crying for a minute. That's it, Sonny. It's only cash we want, Dan said. Tell your pa to pay us, and we'll help him guard his crops. Jake hardly expected a scared boy to believe that, but the boy did stop crying. He spoke to his father in the old tongue, and the man whose face ran with tears composed himself a little and jabbered at the boy. The boy turned and ran lickety-split for the sod house. Go with him and see what you can find, boys, Dan said. Me and Jake can ride herd on the family, I guess. They don't look too violent. Ten minutes later, the boy came racing back, crying again, and Froglip and the two younger Suggses followed. They had an old leather wallet with them, which Roy Suggs threw to Dan. It had two small gold pieces in it. Why, this ain't but four dollars, Dan said. Did you look good? Yeah, we tore up the chimney and opened all the trunks, Roy said. That purse was under the pallet they sleep on. They don't have a darn thing worth taking besides that. Four dollars to see them through, Dan said. That won't help them much. We might as well take it. He took the two gold pieces and tossed the worn leather purse back at the man's feet. Let's go, he said. Jake was glad to see it come to no worse than that, but as they were riding away, Froglip turned and loped over to the milk cows. What's he aim to do, shoot the milk cows? Little Eddie asked, for Froglip had his pistol in his hand. I didn't ask him and he didn't say, Dan replied. Froglip rode up beside the cows and fired a couple of shots into the air. When the cows started a lumbering run, he skillfully turned them up the slope and chased them right onto the roof of the sod house. The sod on the roof had grass still on it and looked not unlike the prairie. The cows took a few steps onto the roof, and then their forequarters disappeared as if they had fallen into a hole. Then their hindquarters disappeared, too. Froglip reined in his horse and watched as both cows fell through the roof of the sod house. A minute later, one came squeezing out the small door, and the other followed. Both cows trotted back to where they had been grazing. That frog, Dan Suggs said, I guess he just wanted to ventilate the house a little. All we got was four dollars, little Eddie said. Well, it was your idea, Dan said. You wanted the practice and you got it. He's mad because he didn't get to shoot nobody, Roy said. He thinks he's a shooter. Well, this is a gun outfit, ain't it? Little Eddie said. We ain't cowboys, so what are we then? 
Travelers, Dan said. Right now we're traveling to Kansas, looking for what we can find. Froglip rejoined them as silently as he had left. Despite himself, Jake could not conquer his fear of the man. Froglip had never said anything hostile to him or even looked his way on the whole trip, and yet Jake felt a sort of apprehension whenever he rode close to the man. In all his travels in the West he had met few men who gave off such a sense of danger. Even Indians didn't, although, of course, there had been few occasions when he had ridden close to an Indian. I wonder if them Saudis will get that roof fixed before the next rain, Dan Sugg said. If they had had a little more cash, Frog might have left them alone. Froglip didn't comment. Chapter 69 It took July only a day or two to determine that Elmira was not in Dodge City. The town was a shock to him, for almost every woman in it seemed to be a whore, and almost every business a saloon. He kept trying to tell himself he wouldn't be surprised, for he had heard for years that Kansas towns were wild. In Missouri, where he had gone to testify at the trial, there was much talk of Kansas. People in Missouri seemed to consider that they had gotten rid of all their riffraff to the cow towns. July quickly concluded that they were right. There might be rough elements in Missouri, but what struck him in Kansas was the absence of any elements that weren't rough. Of course, there were a few stores and a livery stable or two in Dodge, even a hotel of sorts, though the whores were in and out of the hotel so much that it seemed more like a whorehouse. Gamblers were thick in the saloons, and he had never seen a place where as many people went armed. The first thing July did was buy a decent horse. He went to the post office, for he felt he owed Fort Smith an explanation as to why he had not come back. For some reason he felt a surge of optimism as he walked down the street to the post office. Now that he had survived the plains, it seemed possible that he could find Ellie after all. He had lost all interest in catching Jake Spoon. He just wanted to find his wife and go home. If Peach didn't like it, and she wouldn't, she would just have to lump it. If Ellie wasn't in Dodge, she would probably be in Abilene. He would soon catch up with her. But to his surprise, the minute he stepped inside the door of the post office, his optimism gave way in a flash to bitter depression. In trying to think of what he would say in his letter, he remembered all that had happened. Roscoe was dead, Joe was dead, the girl was dead, and Ellie not found. Maybe she too was dead. All he had to report was death and failure. At the thought of poor Roscoe, gutted and left under a little pile of rocks on the prairie, his eyes filled with tears, and he had to turn and walk back out the door to keep from embarrassing himself. He walked along the dusty street for a few minutes, wiping the tears out of his eyes with his shirt sleeve. One or two men observed him curiously. It was obvious that he was upset, but no one said anything to him. He remembered walking into the post office in Fort Worth and getting the letter that told him about Ellie. Since then, it had all been puzzlement and pain. He felt that in most ways it would have been better if he had died on the plains with the rest of them. He was tired of wandering and looking. But he hadn't died, and eventually he turned and went back to the post office, which was empty except for an elderly clerk with a white mustache. Well, you're back, the clerk said. That was you a while ago, wasn't it? That was me, July admitted. He bought an envelope, a stamp, and a couple of sheets of writing paper and the clerk, who seemed kindly, loaned him a pencil to write with. "'You can write it right here at the window,' the clerk said. "'We're not doing much business today.' July started, and then, to his embarrassment, began to cry again. His memories were too sad, his hopes too thin. To have to say things on paper seemed a terrible task, for it stirred the memories. "'I guess somebody died, and you've got to write their folks, is that it?' the clerk said. "'Yes.' July said. Only two of them didn't have no folks. He vaguely remembered that Roscoe had a few brothers, but none of them lived around Fort Smith or had been heard of in years. 
He wiped his eyes on his shirt sleeve again, reflecting that he had cried more in the last few weeks than he had in his whole life up to that point. After standing there, staring at the paper for a few minutes, he finally wrote a brief letter addressed to Peach. Dear Peach, Roscoe Brown was killed by a bad outlaw, so was Joe. A girl named Janie was also killed. I don't know much about her. Roscoe said he met her in the woods. I don't know when I will be back. The folks can hire another sheriff if they want to. Somebody has to look after the town. Your brother-in-law, July Johnson. He had already pretty well convinced himself that Elmira was not in Dodge City, for he had been in every public place in town and had not seen her. But since the old clerk seemed kindly, he thought he might as well ask. Maybe she had come in to mail a letter at some point. I'm looking for a woman named Elmira, he said. She's got brown hair and she ain't very big. Ellie, the clerk said. Why, I ain't seen Ellie in two or three years. Seems like I heard she moved to Abilene. That's her, July said, encouraged again all of a sudden. Ellie had been living in Abilene before she moved to St. Joe, where he had found her. I thought she might have come back, he added. No, ain't seen her, the clerk said, but you might ask Jenny up at the third saloon. She and Elmira used to be thick ones. I think they even married the same man, if you want to call it married. Oh, Mr. Boot, July asked. Yes, D. Boot, the scoundrel, the clerk said. How could he be married to the two of them, July asked, not sure he wanted the information, but unable to stop talking to a man who could tell him something about Ellie. Why, D. Boot would bed down with a possum if the possum was female. He was a cutter with the ladies. Didn't he die of smallpox? July asked. The clerk shook his head. Not so far as I know, he said. He's up in Ogallala or Deadwood or somewhere, where there's lots of whores and not too much law. I imagine he's got five or six whores in his string right now. Of course, he could have died, but he's my nephew, and I ain't heard no news to that effect. Thank you for the loan of the pencil, July said. He turned and walked out. He went straight to the livery stable and got his new horse, whose name was Pete. If Elmira wasn't in Dodge, she might be in Abilene, so he might as well start. But he didn't start. He rode halfway out of town and then went back to the third saloon from the post office and inquired about the woman named Jenny. They said she had moved to another bar up the street, a cowboy was even kind enough to point out the bar. A herd had been sold that morning and was being loaded onto boxcars. July rode over and watched the work a while. Slow work, and made slower by the cattle's long horns, which kept getting tangled with one another as the cattle were being forced up the narrow loading chute. The cowboys yelled and popped their quirts, and the horses behaved expertly, but despite that it seemed to take a long time to fill a boxcar. Still, July liked the look of the cowboys he always had, even when they got a little rowdy, as they sometimes did in Fort Smith. They were young and friendly and seemed not to have a care in the world. They rode as if they were grown to their horses. Their teamwork when the cattle misbehaved and tried to break out was interesting to see. He saw a cowboy rope a running steer by the horns and then cleverly trip it so that the steer fell heavily. When the animal rose, it showed no more fight and was soon loaded. After watching the loading for a while, he went back to the saloon where the woman named Jenny was said to work. He inquired for her at the bar and the bartender, a skinny runt, said she was busy and asked if he wanted a whiskey. July seldom drank whiskey, but he said yes, to be courteous mainly. If he was taking up space in a bar, he ought to pay for it, he figured. So he took the whiskey and sipped it until it was gone, and then took another. Soon he was feeling heavy, as if it would be difficult to walk fast if he had to. But in fact he didn't have to. Women came and went in the saloon but the bartender who poured the whiskies kept assuring him that Jenny would be down any minute. July kept drinking. It seemed to him that he was taking on weight in a hurry. He felt that just getting out of his chair would be more than he could do. He felt so heavy. 
The bartender kept bringing whiskeys, and it seemed to July he must be running up quite a bill, but it didn't worry him. Occasionally a cowboy would pass by, his spurs jingling. Some of them gave July a look, but none of them spoke to him. It was comfortable to sit in the saloon. As sheriff, he had usually avoided them unless he had business in one. It had always puzzled him how some men could spend their days just sitting in a saloon, drinking. But now it was beginning to seem less puzzling. It was restful, and the heavy feeling that came with the drinking was a relief to him in a way. For the last few weeks he had been struggling to do things which were beyond his powers. He knew he was supposed to keep trying, even if he wasn't succeeding, but it was pleasant not to try for a little while.